everyone, and welcome to the Thought Leader at the Workplace. My name is Ruchira Gokhale, and I'm here on behalf of Interweave Consulting. Interweave is a diversity, equity, inclusion consulting firm focused exclusively on building inclusive, equitable, and safe workplaces for all. To know more about us and our solutions, please visit us on www dot interview dot i n or you could write in to us at mira that is m i r a mira at interview dot in. This, as you may be aware, is our second panel discussion that we bring you in this series. Today's discussion will help you gain insights into how organizations are navigating this important and unique journey. We will have the opportunity to hear from organizations that have made considerable strides when it comes to enabling accessibility, hiring, developing talent, and creating an inclusive culture for persons with disability. Before I introduce my esteemed panel, here are some pointers for those of you who are joining us today. There is a CC, which is a closed caption, option available on all the three platforms that is LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. So please feel free to use as needed request all of you to type in your questions and do keep them coming in the chat box. And we promise to make time for as many as we can and in the last 15 minutes of this conversation. For any queries, any details that you'd like, again, reach out to us at Mira, M-I-R-A, Mira at interview.in or our website, www.interview.in. If you'd like to receive updates on our future programs, events, there is a Google form link that is available in the comment section. Do use that. The recording of this session will be available to you on our YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, let me introduce to you our panelists. Our first panelist is Aradhna Lal, SVP Sustainability and ESG at Lemon Tree. Aradhna is a TEDx speaker and leads sustainability ESG initiatives at Lemon Tree, including planet, environment, people, inclusion, and diversity. Aradhna co-leads recruitment of employees with disability and leads new initiatives in the disability space. She has, over the last nine years, run trials with people with Down syndrome and autism, as well as visually impaired or with low vision. Aradhna is an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and has 29 years of experience in sales, marketing, corporate communications, and sustainability. Welcome, Aradhna. Our next panelist is Rakesh Prasad, AVP and head DNI at Indico. Rakesh heads human resources for the in flight department and leads diversity and inclusion. He is also a certified coach, and as part of his coaching intervention, he enables leaders and senior managers to enhance their self-awareness and have greater impact in their productivity. His area of focus includes self-mastery, executive presence, team integration, communication influence, influence without authority, and holistic wellness. Welcome, Rakesh. Our third panelist is Antana Chiramil, HR Lead, Disability ERG at Microsoft. Antana is an HR professional with over 15 years of corporate experience. Being passionate about DNI, she has been working in the space for over a decade now. She joined Microsoft in 2018, and as an HR business partner, she is known for her association with Disability ERG and work she has done with regards to hiring and onboarding of persons with disability. Currently, she is the senior HR manager for Customer and Partner Solutions India, area supporting the customer success, digital natives, and small and medium corporate business teams, and a member of Microsoft, Microsoft's HR DNI advisory board. Anjana, welcome to the panel. Our final panelist for this afternoon is Ranjit Jose, VP HR at Diageo. 
With more than a decade and a half of professional experience, Ranjit has had the opportunity to work in diverse organizations and the rare exposure to have set up and successfully run an entrepreneurial venture. His high technology and business acumen with a hardwired approach to keeping things simple has always paid off on the professional front. His areas of HR expertise are in talent management, leadership development, and strategic business partnering. His purpose in life at this point in time is, as he says, to lead with my passion for life, help others find meaning and create possibilities. Welcome to the panel, Ranjit. So with this welcome extended to all four panelists that we have, let me begin with a question that I'd like to open to all four panelists. And the question that um, I have is, if you could share with us your organization's diversity, equity, inclusion philosophy with a special focus on persons with disability. Aradhna, could we please begin with you? Yeah, thank you, Ruchira. Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here talking about the work we do at Lemon Tree Hotels. Um, we are an organization which is now 20 years old. In September, we've just completed 20 years of our existence. And the inclusion and diversity work has been going on for 15 years. So if you look at it, it's become a part of our culture and the way we do business. Uh, when we started initially, it was an experiment. It was a pilot. And we started with deaf team members. Uh, after about a year, or year and a half, an evaluation was done as to how that whole program and that pilot was working. And our understanding was that if we train those team members well, they perform the job as well as, if not better, than other team members. And the fact that they cannot hear or speak is immaterial to the work that they're doing. So we moved forward from there saying, let's make this part of our HR policy. So today, hiring people with disability and what we call inclusion and diversity is a part of our HR strategy. We are at this time 85 hotels in 52 destinations within and outside India. And every time we open a new hotel, when we are planning the staffing, suppose we say this hotel has to have 100 staff and there should be so many in front office, so many in food and beverage, so many in housekeeping and so on. Within those teams, we are also saying that there should be so many. So suppose five or seven or ten, whatever that number is, depending on the team size, should be a person with disability. So it's planned from the day you start hiring for that hotel. So what I want to really uh, sort of submit to everybody here is that it's part of our culture. It is the way we do business. It is an HR approach. It has nothing to do with charity. And it's not experimental anymore. It was for the first one year, but not anymore. And today, of course, uh, there are multiple kinds of disabilities. There is deaf, there is a physical handicap, low vision, acid survivor. We've also moved into the intellectual disability space. So there's Down syndrome, slow learner, mild MR, autism. And going forward, we're going to do some more because, you know, the RPWD Act of 2016 expanded the definitions to 22. So we'll work on more of, we're already working on more actually right now. So broadly speaking, it's a cultural and a strategic initiative. All right. Thank you so much, Aradhna. We are going to hear more about the great work that's happening at Lemon Tree. Ranjit, could we hear from you, please? Thank you, Ruchira. And thanks for having me here. I think uh, Diageo again, uh, is globally known for its DEI, and last year we were uh, one of the top employers in the UK, awarded uh, in the UK for DNI and our presentation and a representation for the community across the world. Our philosophy broadly revolves around awareness, education, and inclusion. And when I say these three words, uh, we mean it from the core uh, of our culture, because in terms of awareness, we are very pertinent and very kind of. Uh, um, uh, practical on this on this particular topic where we say that look uh, and Aradna mentioned that it, it is not a charity work that we're doing uh, it, it is it is culturally to in tune our people in terms of why this section of population irrespective of physical attributes should be part of uh, our mainstream workforce right uh, that's on awareness on education we focus primarily on the high touch point places you know because when an employee is in an organization uh, there is a manager, there are functions like HR, admin, uh, your ask HR functions, HR ops, uh, and things like that, which are high touch point functions. If you were to get those touch points right, 
the employee experience drastically changes. So our, our philosophy is to keep these touch points very well aware of the need on the ground. And lastly, on, on inclusion, we are focused on making most of our policies, if at all of our policies, very neutral towards PWD, right? Uh, it's not a special bracket that we say also includes, but you know, if the policy were to be read, it should naturally include uh, persons with disability and not specifically call them out or anything like that. So that's a that's a slightly mature state to be in, uh, and you know that's what we are gunning for. Uh, but broadly, these are the three pillars around which uh, you know our global philosophy on uh, DEI, especially with PWD, rests on. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. Rakesh, could you please share what is the Indigo philosophy? <clears throat> Sorry. The Indigo philosophy, you know, when we started the airline, we have always worked, looked upon three things. One is the on-time performance. The other one is hassle-free and the great customer experience. Mm, and when we say this, we mean it for the customers and for the employees as well. One of the most important aspects was the hassle-free experience of our employees as well. And therefore, we looked at various elements that when we started our journey towards encompassing people, be the persons with disability to come and work with us, is where we looked at, you know, what are the possibilities where a person with disability can come and work with us here comfortably. So we started doing those accessibility audits at that point in time to see that what are the work allocations where they can come and be comfortable. So, um, of course, in terms of hassle-free, that's the element that drives all our processes, our policies. Uh, for the customers and the employees as well. Now, for the customers, if you look at it, you know, we started with this, with the, the, the fact that you have the stepless ramp. So somebody can just get into the aircraft vis-a-vis -vis what you see when people get up. Uh, be persons with disability on a wheelchair, they are, they are moving on the step ladders with two people around, which is very unsafe. So we looked into that aspect. Very, very important. That was one element from the customer standpoint. And then it became very, very easy for people to reach to the aircraft. Second thing, there is something called a web content accessible guide. And then in, in that web content accessible guide is what we, we sort of created so that uh, it, would be, it would have an ease of access for, uh, you know, people who, who are not able to access the website. And then uh, we also had these safety briefing booklets in the aircraft, uh, which was in Braille. And therefore, that's an addition for the persons who are blind. So that's from the customer standpoint. And um, uh, and obviously, and these are the elements, that, these are the things that we brought in so that it gives a very hassle-free experience to people around. So largely, our philosophy is around making it a hassle-free experience in terms of the persons with disability, whether it is the customers or whether it is our employees. Thank you so much, Rakesh. Anjana, Anjana finally, what would you share for Microsoft? Hey, um... I think it's Microsoft's uh, mission, which is to empower every person and every planet on the, every person and every, uh, you know, on the planet to achieve more. And I think you can't say every person when you don't include the 1 billion people with disabilities out there. And I think it's with that mission that Microsoft changed its entire core in 2015 to say that diversity and inclusion is going to be a core part of our culture, right? Without which, I don't think we can get to where we have gotten today. Uh, it's a part of our core priority. Every employee in Microsoft has it as an agenda built into you know, our performance philosophy as well. And at the end of the day, um, of course, diversity and inclusion is huge. The spectrums, there are lots to it. But I think just taking it down to the persons with disabilities, I think Microsoft is one of the organizations that has early on realized that the disability divide that the World Bank has you know, defined, that there is a huge disability divide, whether it's social, -nomic, social political, or economic, uh, that cannot be fulfilled unless digitally and using technology, we make advancements, right? Uh, of course, a lot of my panels talked about you know, infrastructure changes and everything, where Microsoft is uniquely positioned is to really use the power of our engineering and technology to kind of make that digital divide smaller. And I think it's with this uh, focus that in 2021, uh, even Satya announced that we're going to have a five-year commitment, that we're going to use all the powerhouses of Microsoft to sort of focus on empowering persons with disability. We will build technology that's always more accessible. Uh, and with that, I think it's been 25 years now, it's accessibility is a part of every engineer's you know, memorandum uh, when they have to design products. And I think from there, it's 
then going into then how are you empowering then people to get access to that technology and getting to learn. Um, I think most recently, and some of you talked about it before we went live, uh, we actually signed an MOU with Enable India to have empower one lakh persons with disabilities in India, working across uh, different organizations, uh, different platforms, but getting that digital technology in the hands of persons with disability and making you know, it matter where it does. And I think the third part is, of course, inclusion. So then once you empower them, you make them employable, then it's about inclusion and what we can do in terms of building awareness. Um, I think one of the things that we've always done is take something like, for example, accessibility badging, which was an in-house training program we did for employees saying, hey, understand accessibility and get yourselves ready to you know, talk accessibility. But as soon as we did it and we realized, hey, this is something that everyone can benefit from, we've opened it out to all you know, anybody out there in the world can today go and get an accessibility badge and understand truly what accessibility means. So I think that's the power of, you know, uh, doing this. And uh, I think that's the journey that we're on, to be honest. Yeah, thank you, Anjana. And I think we are going to probe a little bit more on that journey that Microsoft is on. So yeah. with that, um, uh, my question goes to uh, Ranjit. So Ranjit, you spoke about, you know, this is not something we're doing for charity, et cetera. So could you help us understand what Diageo sees as the triggers to bring this focus on inclusion for persons with disability at the workplace? And what are some of the important steps that have been taken to make the workplace accessible for them? So um, on the philosophy and the triggers, especially, I mean, I don't think there is a separate trigger because like Anjana said, there is a divide and large organizations like ours, uh, you know, who contribute and, and, and our purpose is celebrating life every day, everywhere. Uh, and you can't, like you said, live that purpose if you don't focus on equity and you don't focus on all sections of society. Like I said, physical attributes or any other attributes that the person bring in cannot be a divide in terms of, you know, non-inclusion. So I think that that was very clear and fundamental from, from the beginning. The second aspect is, you know, it's great to talk about all of this, but actually when the rubber hits the road, uh, you know, are you holding your leaders and your people accountable for this? So, so we have a very number metric based target to say that, look, we will represent and you know our industry is difficult our industry is in the service in the hospitality industry very much like lemon tree and uh, indigo uh, and you know uh, and, and the challenges there are are, are, are multifold uh, you know it's not something that you tech enable and leave it at that it's not it's not as simple as that so we've said that look we will have realistic targets and depending on what part of the geography you are in what part of the world you are in it can be locally governed right so local bodies local govern uh, the local organizations the markets are completely in charge in terms of what that number should be and senior leaders have it as part of their metrics uh, you know world over third uh, there are global guidelines around these things you know there are global guidelines around hiring there are global guidelines around what happens but i think something that is commendable and i think lots of mature organizations do it is that let's take an example of hiring let's say you want to hire a person and the best person for that job is somebody with a particular disability there are certain things that you will do in terms of infrastructure, tech enablement and things like that, which which the department is not budgeted for. So for that, is it is completely centrally born. So the manager or a department doesn't have to worry about uh, any additional cost because that is then sponsored from the center. Right? That's very much a central cost. And this is something that I know that Microsoft does as well. Right? So it's, it's very much attuned to uh, you know that kind of uh, uh, philosophy that we have. Um, does this answer most of what you've asked me or have I missed out something? And Ranjit, I know it does mostly. Would you also, there was a part of the question that said in terms of anything accessibility wise, anything else that you'd like to speak of? So the journey for us in India at least started off uh, during uh, just probably just before the pandemic struck, right? So mm -hmm. in a way, we were blessed because most people for the last two, two and a half years were working from home. It made our, right. e our journey so much easier because, you know, people were working from the comforts of their homes. But we took that time to do our facilities audit. We took uh, a lot of care in terms of making sure that all our facilities, at least the ones, the larger ones in Bangalore, uh, uh, you know, and across India are accessible to uh, uh, right. PWDs. 
we have looked at uh, uh, you know restrooms which which can be kind of converted and we've spent uh, enough time and and resources there to make it completely friendly we've taken care of minute things like uh, you know transportation carpeting for wheelchair access people uh, most of these things have been done and it is a formal audit that happened uh, which then got with that which, which then got implemented uh, the way it should be uh, so we are we are at par with large organizations when it comes to right. uh, the accessibility front uh, you know and that's something that we are looking at uh, doing ongoing great Thank you for that, Ranjit. Uh, and Rakesh, my next question is for you uh, along similar line, uh, but as the first commercial aviation company to take up this agenda, how have you enabled accessibility for persons with disability? What are some of the steps that Indigo has taken to ensure that the larger ecosystem is supportive of persons with disability, including customer facing roles? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll answer this in two folds. One I'll talk from the employee standpoint and the other is from the customer standpoint. So let me start with the customer standpoint. As I said, we have these, uh, you know, the first time in the country you might have seen the stepless ramp. That was one of the things that we very clearly stood out to say that we will make sure that the travel of the customers who are persons with disability should be hassle free. As I said, our one of the elements, the philosophy is to keep it hassle free. The other thing also we looked into for the from the customer standpoint is the web content accessible guide that gives an access to people to go ahead and uh, access the web content. And the third one is, uh, you know, the Braille in the aircraft so that the persons who are blind, they can have the access to the safety instruction guidelines, because that's a very important element to when you're flying an airplane. Emergency is always taken as, I mean, generally people see cabin crew more like a serving uh, food and drink, but they are highly trained in terms of taking care of passengers just in case there is an unforeseen incident or an accident. These are a couple of things that we looked at from the customer standpoint. From the from the employee standpoint, um, when we started, obviously, we also reached out to, uh, to understand from the industry, the people who have been doing great, like, you know, Lemon Tree, we reached out to uh, Hari in Lemon Tree. And, uh, you know, they were very, very supportive of, uh, you know, talking about the practices they have. <clears throat> so we learned a lot uh, even before getting in and talking about the fact that we want to uh, give opportunity to persons with disability come and be a success, come and be a part of the success story of Indigo. So that's uh, one sort of a research we did. A lot of study went in there. Then the accessibility audit, and then and then of course we went out to say that okay now we are very open to you know let the persons with disability come and join us. We also did the role mappings because in airport if you see the, largely the, the people who are there. Uh, in the in the organization, the major major chunk of them are resting in the airport operation and customer service department, which is the, which are the people when you see when you get into the airport. So there are a lot of these roles where you the, where the person with disability, especially the locomotor disability, cannot get into for the fact that the infrastructure is different. It is a little elevated and things like the ramp areas where you know the the ramp area is a little unsafe for them. For the fact that somebody who is a deaf and mute cannot listen and there is a coach coming from behind. So very, very vulnerable towards such kind of an incident or an accident. So therefore, we looked at the job, map, the role mappings that which are the roles that we can truly bring them in where they feel comfortable. So our priority was that for a person with disability, they should be more comfortable than anything else. And that's what took the front seat. And obviously, after that, we went into making the people aware. And, uh, you know, in terms of their awareness, what are the do's and don'ts? How do you deal with them? What are the things that you should talk, what you should not say? And there are many of them that we, you know, went ahead to talk about it. And then we also introduced some of the things like, you know, refreshers, a refresher, an annual refresher, which will be obviously an e-refresher for people to keep getting refreshed on things that they have learned about the do's and don'ts of persons with disability. And then we went ahead to say that uh, the, to the managers that, okay, now this also becomes your responsibilities to make sure that this is constantly and sustainable process of awareness. And therefore we launched something called diversity and inclusion champions. And these champions do what they do in, in, in airport. You will see generally the operational team, they do briefings and debriefings. So before going for any shift or a duty, the whole team will come and do a brief if there are any specific things that needs to be addressed that will be spoken about in these briefings. So we said, okay, let's introduce that as a part of the DNI champion checklist. And uh, these are some people called eye coaches who come and talk about the sensitization of people in terms of persons with disability. Of course, other elements were also there like LGBT. 
But we said, okay, that let happen, let that be there, so that you continuously and enough and more talk about it, and that's how it becomes an affirmation to people to go ahead and execute the way we think about it. Because as Ranjit said, it's very, very correctly. You know, what's right on the floor when the tire hits the road? Uh, the, the, what did you say? The tire hits the road. You know, that's when you really get to know what it is like. And therefore, that was the most important aspect to make sure that people on the ground are very, very clear about what our thought process is, what our strategy is. It should not be a strategy. We said, you know, a strategy, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And therefore, we want to create a culture where we don't want that what we do is what people don't know. So it is a very transparent culture. And then, of course, it had the buy-in of the leaders. Because at Indigo, we have diverse people working across the length and breadth of the country, wherever we have our stations. So we had the buy-in of the leaders, and then leaders also pushed it from there. And so therefore, uh, adoption of the of the practices that we launched, assimilation of people and adoption of the practices that we launched was uh, was hassle-free and easier as compared to had we not done all of this. Yeah, thank you for that. So I think what I gather from both you and Ranjit is the kind of journey that you've been on for a few years. It's not something that just suddenly has been a focus. It's been a sustained journey and effort. So uh, Aratha, my question uh, is for you next. Um, so we all know Lemon Tree is known for the success that it's had with truly integrating persons with disability into the workplace. What we really like to know is how have you gone about, you know, building that talent pipeline, including both hiring and developing talent? I think this is one of the most critical areas and in fact very often the first step even that most organizations continue to struggle with so this will be very helpful yes sure Uchra. i we have in fact developed a model before i come to that i just wanted to add uh based on what diageo said and indigo said our inclusion is also toward both employee and consumers because after all we are right. hotels if we cannot welcome guests of different abilities then what's the point? So all our hotels are built to universal access design and they're very accessible buildings. We seem to have another advantage from a client's perspective now that because our team is so well trained in understanding in disability and in fact, all our employees know sign language. So the whole company knows English, Hindi and sign language, Indian sign language. So it's really quite powerful. And, um, you know, the guests who come here, suppose someone is deaf or someone's visually impaired or maybe even an autistic guest, they feel uh, kind of comfortable and they feel that the staff will know how to engage with them. So it's a very interesting fallout of our employment of people with disability that the faith that consumers place in us is uh, of a different order. So I just wanted to add that point. Coming back to your question, how do we go about it? And if another company were to... Uh, want to build an inclusive culture, how shall they do it? Um, it's really quite simple. There are, we've called it the seven pillar model. If you don't mind, Richard, you can share the slide and I can speak easily. You can just yeah, go to the yeah, absolutely. Where the, where the seven yeah, pillars. Yeah, the slide are. comes up. Yeah. The next one, yeah. So what we realized over a period of now 15 years was that for an organization to be able to truly integrate inclusion and diversity into the company, uh, it's important to go through a certain flow. Now, sometimes one of these steps comes before the other. We've numbered it a certain way, but actually a few things work parallelly. So the first step really is the vision and the cascade. This means it comes from the very top of the organization. It is not something that should be a DNI agenda or an HR agenda. It really won't work. So the person who's the head of your company, chairman, president, country head, whatever that role is called, uh, should be on board and should understand that it is part of the business model and it's not a matter of charity. The same needs to be cascaded to the C-suite, to the whole team of CXOs, because eventually the implementation is done in different departments. If you take a hotel company, operations has to understand, sales has to understand, marketing, finance, engineering, housekeeping. Everyone has to understand that this works well and they have to believe, obviously. The second aspect is you need a dedicated resource, such as earlier Hari and myself together. Now Hari has moved on from the inventory. Uh, and there are other team members who are handling it from HR. The third aspect is sensitization. Now, this is really critical. Just because the person heading the company and the leadership team believes and understands diversity and inclusion doesn't mean our entire 6,500 employees can understand, especially those who are new and joining us through the year. So sensitization is a process where you're kind of briefing them and telling them the logic 
as to why are we going in for disability plus if in their team there's going to be someone who's deaf or someone who has down syndrome or someone who's an asset survivor how are they expected to engage with that person they have to be taught that as well so we take the help of our ngo partners to do that the job mapping process uh, rakesh referred to it in fact is where we observe the tasks with the help of our ngo partners who are experts in disability we observe all the tasks that are done in a particular role so suppose at the front office suppose the guest service executive in the coffee shop suppose it's a room boy in housekeeping on the floor whichever role you look at every role typically has 25 or 30 tasks so we ask uh, the ngo partner to look at those tasks and observe the degree of difficulty in terms of physical aspects in terms of intellectual aspects and decision making in the moment versus things that are pre decided and you don't have to decide anything it's a fixed sop and you just go forward so this helps us align best which disability will work with which role it's a broad definition it doesn't mean you can't intermix things you can but the point is it's done broadly the fifth pillar is obvious because i've mentioned partners so many times already so our ngo partners we have to build up with them and also i would say the partnerships extend to other people in the industry so the way in which we are sharing thoughts here there are many platforms on which we share thoughts with other companies as well so we also learn from them we also help them that is also partnership the sixth aspect of the or the sixth pillar is that don't sort of jump into the whole story in one go it will be very hard run some pilots run some traineeships monitor them well and review them because you need to learn that what is not working is there something wrong with the training process does the sop need to be redefined are the other team members not briefed enough are they not getting it so therefore another sensitization needs to be done what needs to be done to improve the entire working and then naturally we go to the seventh pillar which is you scale up so for any organization to say that they are inclusive it's important for them to make it a national program in their company and if it's a multinational company then hopefully international diageo already mentioned that microsoft already mentioned it both of them talked about it so it becomes a global program eventually maybe it comes from an international place or maybe it starts in india it doesn't matter where it starts but the point is it it needs to scale up to the whole organization so broadly speaking this is our seven pillar approach for inclusion and if any organization has more questions and wants to know more we can talk about that thanks to utra yeah thank you so much uh, this is a this is a great framework for anyone who is starting out and i'm i'm sure there are listeners who are benefiting from seeing this Uh, so thank you for that, um, Aradna. And um, along similar lines, Anjana, uh, could you please talk about or elaborate rather on how Microsoft has used technology to aid accessibility and inclusion for persons with disability? So what are some of those examples that you'd like to share? Yeah, and I think uh, and I, before I start into Microsoft, there's this wonderful philosophy of inclusive design, right? You design for all or you design for one uh, and there you go for you design for one but it ends up being used by multiple other people and that's the whole philosophy of inclusive design so in microsoft you had started with sticky keys on your keyboard that you know you could use to sort of help get those shortcuts uh, to today if i think very recently last earlier this week we launched uh, focus assist on windows 11 which is for anybody who has a a locomotor disability or you know has speech can kind of use those aids to sort of navigate the entire windows platform um today uh, we have asl is being introduced into games and xbox right like uh, uh, the i think the it's called the uh, um uh, horizon 5 forza has a horizon 5 is one of the games in which we've introduced asl american sign language but increasingly like you're looking at it and all of this work has been done in consultation with persons with disabilities from within microsoft the community right we have employee resource groups that actually aid and give feedback back to the tech engineering team that are working on these products and are helping build that you know uh, accessibility features uh, the xbox adaptive controller was another such feature that was created keeping in mind you know that hey persons with disabilities need different devices they want to be able to plug in those different assistive technologies and uh, you know uh, chargers that they they use and they are familiar with and how can we make it more accessible to them so i think uh, the work that microsoft has been doing has been on the lines of inclusive design 
which I think is keeping in mind persons with disability. But one of the stories I like to talk about is, you know, there's this whole seeing for AI app that Microsoft has built. So you can actually download it. It's an application that you have, which is used largely by the persons with uh, visual impairment, right? Community, right? They can use it. You point it at anything. It reads the text. It describes what, you know, image you're looking at or what vision you're looking at. Uh, and interestingly, once I learned about the app, I have started using it to convert any, uh, you know, posters or any hard, uh, uh, you know, pages that have text on it into digital text because that's what the app does, right? For someone uh, who is not with visual impairment, they have leveraged it to read out the text and they can also convert into digital text. And I use it for my, you know, immediate digitization of physical content. And I think that's the beauty of it. Uh, the bendy straws was created by a person uh, for his daughter who could not drink, but it's used by everybody today in terms of being able to use. Um, and the last one, I have a story of uh, Shweta M, who's a senior program manager, you know, someone I'm very a uh, big fan of. And uh, she's a person living in US who used to converse on teams with her family back home. And interestingly, because she's a person who's hard of hearing, um, you know, lip movement was difficult when there was a background. So the entire blur feature that many of us are using today was invented by Shweta because she wanted to be able to converse with her family back home. And I think that's the beauty of just using technology to sort of uh, build in a feature that probably is, you know, helping the persons with disability. But at the same time, I think it's it's got larger implementation across as well. So that's uh, that's a little bit about what Microsoft is doing there today. Yeah, amazing work, Anjana. Thank you for that. And that story is something that I use very often as well, the blur feature, but now I have a name to it. I didn't so yeah. far. So thank you for that. Right. Um, so uh, Ranjit, again, um, you know, you spoke about how when the rubber hits the road, that's really where um, whether people feel included or not, that's really where it matters. So what would you say has Diageo done intentionally to build this culture of inclusion? You know, for example, how does a team and manager support a team member who is a person with disability? How are they equipped to do that? So two things, uh, uh, Ruchita, and thanks for bringing this up. Like I said, you know, this is coming back to the forefront at this point in time because, you know, we're calling people back to the workplaces. Uh, there's the, the entire, uh, you know, the exodus that happened is coming back now and all the more focus on 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 uh, you know uh, how managers and employees uh, would look at this so one is we had a very powerful program on unconscious bias and this was something that uh, you know we ran across the organization facilitated by senior leaders and uh, you know like i said the whole culture of not being able to call out something but yet bring that focus on on disability is something that's very powerful this was on on uh, disability, on ethnicity, on race, on a lot of things that you know normally tends to fall under the unconscious bias category. So very powerful program that most of our employees, in fact, all of our employees have gone through, led by senior leaders is one thing. The second one, and this is a journey that we've started, um, we are we, we are looking at, and I spoke specifically about high touch point areas, right? So high touch point areas would be managers, would be team members, would be functions like facilities and services, HR, recruitment. Uh, this is our focus for now when we say that, look, if you are able to kind of make people feel included, if you are able to kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, go over your un unconscious biases, uh, then half the battle is won. You know? and, and, and that's the journey that we're undertaking at this point in time, where we're saying that as and when people get hired, as and when people get included, into the organization, are you ticking off the high touch point areas for this particular training program? People are aware. And then the next journey is obviously like we do our course trainings and everything else, which are mandatory. And I'm very sure the law will also follow suit in terms of, uh, you know, the larger organizations catching on. Uh, we, we're thinking of making this mandatory at some point in time, you know, where everybody is equipped and trained to deal with and handle and to include uh, uh, people with different physical attributes or disabilities for that matter. Yeah, very powerful stuff. Thank you for that, uh, Ranjit. And um, Anjana, we of course absolutely have to hear from you about the great work that the ERG for Disability is doing. We know that you have a very active ERG. So if you could share with us, how does this group influence the ecosystem for continued inclusion and innovation? For sure. 
At Microsoft, we actually launched the disability ERG chapter for India in 2018. And I think at the time of launch, uh, even we weren't sure like, you know, what's going to happen with this org or this group, uh, you know, what impact is it going to ha have? And very interestingly, one of the persons who came up and, you know, came forward to sort of lead the group was someone who, was, who had a hidden disability and was not vocal at that point of time about the disability, but had a lot of passion and conviction. And that sort of helped us form together. Today, we are a group of about more than 500, 600 people, persons with disabilities and allies. But what I've seen interestingly over the years is that uh, in the core team, right, which started out with maybe one or two persons with disability, you know, signing up and voicing out and saying, hey, I want to be part of this, um, you know, for passionate people with vision disabilities, hearing disabilities. Today, we have people with locomotor disabilities, uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, all signing up and saying, hey, I want to be a part of this. I'm passionate. And, and we have allies. And that number increasing and the representation increasing in the core team itself. And then, of course, the larger uh, ERG that we have. That's for me is a good indicator of, you know, we're doing the right things. And how does it align? Um, I think all our employee resource groups align with Microsoft's diversity and inclusion plan. Uh, and we have four pillars to it, right? Um, transforming our culture, empowering our people, uh, increasing the talent pipeline, and then delighting our customers. And I think we've taken the same four pillars for our ERG as well. It very much aligns to what we want to do when it comes to persons with you know, disabilities and the inclusion of the same. And we've really put those pillars as our charter and created these core groups that work, saying that, okay, um, transform our culture. What can we do? Can we, you know, kind of uh, do more demystifying disability series? So we kind of like go out there. When I started out in the business I was part of, which was a support engineering group, uh, we actually, the, the entire awareness was through tech for all sessions. And when we said this tech for all, people were curious, hey, what's tech for all? And interestingly, we brought in one of the persons who you know, talks about accessibility and evangelizes it. And he just talked about, did you know the amount of tech we have and the features that are accessible, that makes it accessible for a person with visual impairment, person with hearing impairment? You know, the minute you sort of sensitize people in that fashion and you understand and you bring in then a person with disability showing the usage of that feature and demonstrating how he or she does their daily work, I think that really opened up mindsets to managers, to the organization, to people saying, oh, I didn't know a person with disability could do this. And I didn't know I could probably work along with them. And then the next thing you know, people are just signing up and hiring has become a regular routine. And you have more managers saying, OK, sign me up. I want to know how I can go get more talent on my organization. And combine it with you know your DNI co-priority, where you're really asking every person out there to build a more inclusive environment, uh, the magic happens. and. Uh, that's what I've seen happen. The employee resource group has done a lot of work around awareness building, has done a lot of work around, uh, you know, going out and speaking in various forums, uh, whether it's our, uh, you know, we have these technology centers in Microsoft technology centers where we call in customers, we talk about our products and services. We bring in the ERG groups to talk about accessibility. And, you know, that, that really helps delight our customers as well. So I think in every forum, in every possible way, uh, we've been, you know, really, evangelizing, talking. And um, to me, honestly, that's uh, this is one passionate group that I think really needs no motivation. Uh, at the same time, it's fun, it's energizing, and it's exciting to be part of. So that's the employer. Yeah, group. thank you. Thank you so much, Anshana. And just a very quick follow-up question. Is there some specific training or equipping for the allies of the ERG in the ERG? We don't distinguish between the allies or persons with disabilities. And like our right. had said, sensitization is something that needs to be done broad-based and across. Uh, so right. we do, uh, and, and, and Microsoft has invested in a lot of trainings when it comes to inclusive hiring and you know specific uh, disability etiquette trainings, accessibility, 101 badging that we do. Um, I, I like to talk about disability etiquette. It's one of my favorite training programs. I myself just got a train and I went ahead and trained like 100, 200 people, actually a seven member organization on it. But it's it's fun. It's it's really, really going out there and telling people that, hey, you know what? Uh, it's okay to not know. And now that you know the language, you know the etiquette, you know the you know the terminology. I think many people don't even know that persons, I mean, we adopted the persons with disability terminology, but many 
uh, folks are even reluctant to address a person with disability because they do not know what's the terminology they need to use and how would they describe it, right? So I think starting out right from there and to going yeah. on to then, hey, talking about that, we need to level the playing field. It's a, it's a divide. It's it's not the person who's disabled, but it's the society, it's the environment, yeah. it's the technology that needs to change. And I think that shifts mindsets a lot. So yeah. um, I think that's the trainings that we've done. Absolutely. Anjana, there are a few questions around the ERG, uh, but I'm going to just keep them with those for the end. There's a couple of audience questions. Keep them for the end. So there is more that you will, yeah, um, we will request you later to speak on with respect to ERG. So, uh, Rakesh, uh, you know, one of the things that we'd like to also hear from you is I'm sure there have been challenges, right? So what are some of those unique challenges that you encountered and how have you been able to navigate those on this journey yeah <clears throat> so in terms of challenges uh, as obviously people who are not used to working with uh, people with persons with disability and then getting into working with persons with disability there needs to have a uh, you know mind shift now in that context as i told you that when we did this awareness session so we realized that uh, people might feel that you know, working with a person with disability on, on certain roles where they will be taking a little more time than someone else. Like, for example, uh, in a check-in counter when you go as a passenger, there is a turnaround time because there is a whole queue right behind. Right. So these were some of the some of the apprehensions that people had. Uh, but other and therefore, when we reached out to them and we had these awareness sessions, uh, and you know, talking about what are the great stuff that they can do, how would they be able to engage with the customers and the employees better? What is it that is going to create a uh, conducive environment for them and for you? How will that emotional intelligence and that compassion come as a whole? Uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, into into the workplace. So all of that uh, then slowly, gradually changed their mindset. And then managers who earlier used to say that we will have a restriction in terms of the total number of persons with disability in the stations are now forthcomingly stating that they would want to have more persons with disability because they have seen the, that, you know, working with them builds a culture, builds an environment where people become more compassionate. Uh, and I remember this when I had spoken to you know, a really long time ago that he said it, that, that that sort of an environment builds in that people are more compassionate. Uh, and that was definitely stuck into my mind. And as, um, you know, Anjana was saying about the workshops and they have this ERG group. Similarly, we have this, uh, you know, the DNI champs, we call it the DNI champs. And uh, these are the folks uh, who do these sensitization sessions, which I spoke a while ago in various forums, in briefings and debriefings. And we also have a, a nodal officer uh, to look into the grievances, if any, from the persons with disability, and uh, so so these are some of the things that we created to to see that you know whatever the challenges we had and how do we encounter them by having some of the other means which would sort of uh, one was obviously the awareness, second was sustaining the awareness through various refreshers and creating a nodal officer. So these are the things that worked and to see right. how much is it working or not, you know, while we do, but what is the success? Are we really successful or not? We, we have this employee uh, survey, which we call it 6E Speak. Mm -hmm. As you know, Indigo, our, our, our call code is 6E. Uh, so in the 6E survey, you know, we introduced this question on diversity and inclusion. And over a period of time now, we get a fairly a good response that people are saying, yes, it's working well within the organization. So these are some of the steps also, uh, you know, that we created so that we understand where we are in terms of our challenges and how do we measure our challenges and how do we measure our success? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Rakesh. And um, Ratna just... Um, coming again back to lemon trees to um, help us understand or you know share some of those unique initiatives that have worked for you in terms of inclusion and empowerment of persons with disability if you were to quote a few of those unique initiatives which one was would it this be yeah well sometimes i wonder which one is unique i find them yeah. all very um, so i'll try to take two different uh, two which are very different in nature 
One is with respect to the deaf colleagues that we have, the speech and hearing impaired, since that's the largest number. It's very important for us to build an environment within the organization that gets stronger and better with respect to sign language, because only then the environment becomes truly inclusive for them. Uh, and I think also what Ranjit spoke about, the idea of unconscious bias, that's also a very important thing to work, uh, work towards to remove unconscious bias. So I'll talk about two, three things we try to do with respect to the deaf, and then I'll talk about intellectual disability, separate, very different. One is, of course, teaching everybody Indian Sign Language. So we have classes in 85 hotels twice a month whenever anyone is joining on the joining date. Each employee is expected to learn the alphabets, basic numbers, not too many numbers, but about 20 or something. Days of the week, colors, and the 10 golden phrases. Okay, You won't be able to construct new sentences and all. It will be very hard. Like You might make short sentences because you know the alphabets, right? The main thing is everyone has to take a test and everyone has to pass the test with 80%. If you don't pass, you take it again and again. We don't limit you. So you can come for the class again, you can come again and, you know, pass. But someone is tracking that at the time of joining, everybody is learning and passing. With respect to growth in the organization, when a person has to move from an executive to a supervisor, to an assistant manager, to a deputy manager and so on, There'll be two things inside that person's performance management system, uh, you know, tracking and the, the KRAs. One will be the goals and targets to hire people with disability, as well as people from economically and socially marginalized. I just want to clarify, I know the subject today is about disability, but our inclusion program is, uh, there are two segments. One is disability and one is economically and socially marginalized. That includes transgender, uh, orphans and abandoned girls, widows and battered women, people who are school dropouts, like they haven't gone beyond class nine and certain focus states like Northeast, Bihar, Jharkhand and all certain focus states also. So when we look at these two segments together, almost 15, 16 percent of our, our organization belongs to one of these segments. Anyway, so the idea is that making sure that uh, everybody is learning that language, of course, and as they're growing in the company, the extent of knowledge of Indian Sign Language has to keep improving. Because see, if you have to supervise a team of 30 people total, which contains, say, seven people who are deaf, you can't manage with the basic training that you got. So you have to learn more and get better and practice. It's all about practice. It's a language, no? If someone teaches me Spanish, I'll have to speak it. Otherwise, how will I do it, right? So it's built into that. That's one aspect. Second aspect. With the help of one of our NGO partners, Sai Swayam Society, we built a DVD. This was about 10 years ago. So now it's available as a soft file, obviously, uh, of a vocabulary of 400 words in the hotel industry. So, you know, salva, uh, cruet set, blah, 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 BNB plate. You know, these are very specific words in the hotel industry. So we built a dictionary, a visual dictionary of 400 words with Indian Sign Language. In fact, uh, Hari, our, my colleague, had led this piece of work and it won a very nice award also. Uh, we won an award as a company, the uh, Indian government award many times for best employer. But I'm saying this item, this uh, dictionary also won. So this is another very useful thing because then the hearing team members can engage very fast and well rather than trying to spell out cruet set like that. You know, it's too difficult. You can't. You need one sign that says to it set, you know, that way. So uh, that was another area. Plus, in our learning and development team, it's been a few years now, we have hired an Indian sign language expert. So normally we go and hire hoteliers, someone who understands front office, someone who understands housekeeping. They have done that work in the past. So as a trainer, they know that function very well and they can train. We now, for the purpose of our deaf colleagues, we hire an Indian sign language expert who has nothing to do with hotels. And then our head of learning and development teaches them what is hotels all about. So teaches them front office, food and beverage, housekeeping, obviously not engineering, it's too technical, but the main operational areas. So that trainer then handles all the uh, deaf colleagues. I'm trying to tell you because it's a very large focus area for us. So here's one story. The other story is, let's look at intellectual and developmental disability and autism. We run two different internships because there are two different NGO partners and the way of engaging with these team members is slightly different. 
in the case of autism they are able to read certain content written in a very simplified way and written with some visual graphics and all in the case of down syndrome and slow learner reading is a little difficult so it has to be through verbal uh, explanation and through role plays and so on so these internships that we are running they are part of the live functional area so they are live in the coffee shop or they are live in housekeeping they obviously have a buddy present at the workplace who can guide them every day they have their managers and supervisors who are keeping an eye open you see because when they're training they may not know all the answers and they can make mistakes they can forget some task so the managers have to make sure that the service continues now this is essential rakesh talked about the time it takes to check in a guest at the indigo counter for a flight so we also have to worry about the time it will take to serve an order the time it will take to get the bill or in the room the time it will take to clear a room so one of the mandates we have given ourselves is that when we hire people with disability we've got to train them in such a manner align the sop in such a manner that the service the guest receives is as good if not better than what they would receive from a person without disability this is crucial because if we decline and we take our service standards down then it's not a business model then you are failing the business model why should the customer wait for the bill to be given for 25 minutes suppose for any reason is 25 minutes rather than 5 minutes why should he wait this makes no sense or 4 minutes or whatever similarly if a guest has to check out and a person with a physical handicap is doing his check out if every other team member does it in 2 minutes or 3 minutes then the physical handicap colleague also has to do it in 2 minutes and 3 minutes and we have to equip them so suppose they need a special keyboard suppose they need a particular space for the wheelchair to be very well aligned with the laptop which is being used to do the check in check out whatever it is it could be an accessibility issue it could be something else we have to take care of it otherwise we are developing the wrong sop if that's what if we are not fulfilling that so therefore even in the case of the intellectual disability program it works very well for us because of the care we take that how will we explain each task how will they understand make them do the role play make them repeat things make them practice 20 20 times there is something called practice hour by the way so when the traineeship gets over and we've given them a job offer i'm talking about down syndrome slow learner and autism because in this case we first train and then make the job offer for the physical disabilities we first bring them in we give the job and then we do training like with any other Uh, team member so after the traineeship is done and the job has been offered we continue on a daily basis with down syndrome to do what's called a practice hour or a training hour it's not an hour actually it's only 20 minutes but we just want to use the word hour so um they just repeat all those 20 tasks some supervisor will teach again okay this is how you set the table this is how you provide the menu this is how you write the order this is how you pour the water whatever the task is because in the case of down syndrome one of the challenges is memory so if they're going to forget then the best way is just keep the training going on repeat 365 days of the year there will be one 15 20 minute training going on so that really helps them and there's also a little visual aid we call it a me book so for each person whether you're on a morning shift or an afternoon shift all your tasks will be there with the help of a photograph So suppose you're pouring water. Suppose you're uh, setting up the buffet. Suppose you're clearing the buffet. Whatever those little little tasks are, there'll be a photograph of each of that boy or girl because you know it has to be personalized. I can't design it from a design company and say here's a lovely little booklet. It will not make any sense to them. It has to be their booklet with their photographs, and you can write three four words there. You can say you know water service. You can say clear the buffet. You can say set the buffet. These simple things they understand. so this me book stays in their pocket and when they tend to forget something they can refer to that book it really works well so what i wanted to highlight in these two conversations was one was the kind of aspects you have to think of when you are dealing with a large group of employees like the deaf and what are the aspects you have to think of that even though the group is small but their needs are very very special and very different so how do you work around it and our ngo partner muskan and action for autism obviously helped us in this work but how do you work around it is what you have to see now the last thing i want to say to the everybody on this uh, session including my panelists you have to come and see the service only then you will believe or agree with what i'm saying <laughs> otherwise i'm just saying it right so everybody come to lemon tree and come and see no rata that was the exact thought
Yeah, 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 that was the exact thought that was running in my head, at least to say, I have to go and experience this for myself. I have a couple of times, but now I know what is behind you know it. So thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. So before we get to the audience uh, questions, which are uh, pouring in, there's a final question to all of you. You can all quickly just respond to that and we'll get to the Q&A section. Uh, you know, we'd like to hear from each one of you on what have been those important lessons that you've learned. I'm sure uh, the listeners that we have today will benefit greatly by hearing what are these lessons so that they don't have to reinvent or go down that path. Over to uh, Anjana, would you like to go first? Oh, sure. I've had so many learnings. It's you know difficult to capture, but and the learnings continue. Um, Interestingly, the you know the first hire that we did in when I when I went on this initiative hiring persons with disability, uh, this was a person with locomotor disability, and uh, he joined the organization day one. I was super excited, you know, had put in so much of effort sensitizing organizations, sensitizing talent acquisition. We got this person on board. Uh, I met him, met him after probably the end of the day, and hey, how's it going? And you know, uh, we're so happy you're here. All of the excitement. And interestingly, we set out hiring, wanting to hire support engineers. The first person we hired was a support engineering manager, right? And this person came in and and, and then he was like, you know, little, yeah, he smiled. He's like, I'm excited to be here, but you know, I need to share with you two things. One is your office ramp. Looks like nobody uses the ramp in the organization. And I was like, why? We, 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 really, we went out of our way to ensure that there's a ramp in the organization. And he was like, I was using it and there was these, wonderful, beautiful bougainvillea plants that were put near the ramp that had overgrown. And, you know, while I was using it, I got cuts on my hand. And that was my first learning of saying that, hey, you know what? We could build in the infrastructure, but if you don't have the right people who use it, you will never know, you know, that it was being put to use the right way. Um, I've had a similar instance with Braille signages that we put up and then someone who actually needed to, let, you know, read the Braille signage came back and said, you know what, it's wrong. This, this signage is wrong. It's, it's, and so then, unless you do it and you have the persons who need it utilizing it, that's the first learning. And so keep hiring. You may make mistakes. And I'm acknowledging humbly that we make mistakes. But unless you bring them in and they tell you, you will not correct. Today, that ramp is plant free, right? Um, second thing he brought up was, you know what, I have uneven legs. Uh, for me, going to the cafeteria, walking around with a tray on my, you know, in my hand and getting food, is embarrassing because I might drop it. Uh, so what can you do for me? And you know, with his help and with our sensitized facilities team, we were able to design a trolley with a tray that can be used. Uh, I think, and that can be used. And then interestingly, over the years, I've seen not just this person use it. I've seen a pregnant women. I've seen a guy with a fractured leg using that trolley in the cafeteria. And the trolley then got on to design in every cafeteria and other locations as well. So that's been a learning for me as well. So I think um, that was one. Two is, you know, uh, our mindsets. We all have a lot of fixed mindset. We've come up in schools and the social political background with which we have brought been brought up. Uh, there is a lot of unconscious bias, as Ranjit said. And I think just being able to, uh, I, I had done I had done this beautifully. We got in uh, the Human Library Organization. So they came in and we actually put books and we had people with disabilities as books you know, human books that people could go in and read as chapters. And when you interact with a person with disability, that's when you get to know a lot more than what you just have this TV and media knowledge otherwise fed into you, right? I think that's something that when you do sensitization, one of the biggest learnings I've had is bring in, I mean, no story without the persons you're talking about being the storytellers, right? So I think everything that you do, please bring in the persons with disability, talk their own stories, their lived experiences, that makes for a better uh, food for content. I mean, for the, uh, like uh, consume content. And I think the last thing I would leave it, and it was a learning uh, where, uh, uh, you know, and I, this was when we were building up a Hyderabad campus, a new campus to go to, and uh, we were about to hire. And I think the GTA, the talent acquisition team came back and said, um, you know what, uh, we have this wonderful person. He meets all the criteria, uh, but you know that building that we have got when we're launching. It doesn't have accessibility. So this is a person with mobility, you know, challenge, and you wouldn't be able to access the the floors because they don't have you know accessible doors, and we don't have all of that. So what should we do? 
and uh, you know me obviously the obvious reaction is hey if your infrastructure is not going to support this person coming into the office itself shouldn't we not hire and then just before taking the decision i happened to meet a member of the erg a very dear friend shriram parsathi he's a social media marketing manager person with 100% visual blindness and he met me and i told him this challenge i'm facing shri what do you think hello did we hey am i audible please hello? continue yeah, yeah we can hear you now anjana okay so i was saying that uh, you know he was like hi the person for the role and with his capability and ability to do the job the infrastructure the uh, the everything else environment you need to change and you need to work on changing for that individual so do not stop the hiring and i think that was a learning for me and i take to all my hiring managers every time i talk about it that if the person is capable of doing the role that you know your you know if it's an engineering role if it's a, a managerial role if it's someone in hr if they have the abilities then don't let infrastructure accommodations come in the way that's for us to go back and fix and not yeah. come in the way of hiring so i think that's the third learning and i'll leave it at that because i think this is a lot more but i think these are stories <laughs> yeah. that really made an impact on me yeah no thank you so much i think you know it's been insightful uh, thank you ranjit what would you say are your top learnings so i think uh, you know one of the things that you know i think i would urge organizations wanting to kind of embark on this journey is to is to very specifically look at Uh, equity and responsibility, and where your organization's maturity stands on on both of this, because as leaders, uh, you know, and, and and I'm not saying that you know all if all all the organizations have to be on the other end of the maturity curve. There there could be there could be journeys that each organization will follow, but I think it's very very important to ascertain the maturity on on which the organization is. before embarking on the journey or at least kind of making that that way forward that's number one number two um, you know again related to the same point you know you can also influence this in multiple ways and i don't think you will tick off all your boxes you will not cross all your t's uh, and dot all your i's before uh, hiring uh, or including uh, people with disabilities uh um, b- because you know there is this age old debate of whether it is dni or ind right what comes first i i think it holds good for pwds as well and i think that's something that we learned very specifically from uh, the journey that we undertook saying that look let's bite the bullet let's do this in all earnest with the right intent of being responsible with the right intent of being an equal opportunity employer and like anjana said uh if the maturity is right everything else will follow so don't wait for the the ideal setup don't wait for the ideal conditions before you can before you can start your journey uh, i think it is the other way around you can start small you can go as you uh, kind of kind of mature in this journey you can partner with uh, people that you're looking at uh, to make this a much more memorable experiential uh, journey for everyone thank you so much very helpful ranjit rakesh what would be the lessons you'd like to share so uh, one of the most important uh, thing that we understood is that let's not jump the uh, let's not jump to meet targets targets because there is a target that everybody is hiring pwd so we should also do that i think the most uh, important uh, aspect here is that first create a conducive environment for somebody who's going to come and work for you so that's the um, otherwise you know it's going to be troublesome for everyone and uh, when we talk about somebody coming and work for you the learning is that create that equitable uh, you know uh, proposition for the persons with disability uh, and give them the right tools to perform as most of us here the members have said that you know we ensure that that accessibility is in place uh, the third one is that the mind shift of people you know because unless and until people are enough and more of aware about various uh, various elements of uh, how to deal with persons with disability like uh, ranjit was talking about uh, unconscious conscious biases so we did a we did a campaign as well called bust the bias campaign and we took up various uh, you know categories of uh, uh, you know persons with disability and we also spoke about lgbt and we spoke about these bust biases and, and then we had some of the leadership talk about their their biases on uh, you know such elements 
And the last one is, of course, the leadership buy-in. <clears throat> I think unless and until there is no leadership buy-in because anything that you do under the PWD has to flow from top to down. It just can't be the other way around. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, the, the training part because we realize that it just cannot be a one-time intervention. There has to be a constant... Uh, constant push and constant talk about such factors that you have taken that as an organization uh, in the forefront. So, so therefore, these are a few of the things that I feel are extremely important and are learnings which uh, if somebody wants to bank into this journey of uh, onboarding PWD, should keep in mind. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Aradna, finally, over to you. I'll say two things. One is uh, by providing a job opportunity to somebody who has a disability in a country like India, um, we are helping that person live with dignity and live with confidence. Um, it is amazing how that person's personality undergoes a change, how that person's physicality undergoes a change. Obviously, if he's a person in a wheelchair, he will not stand up. I don't mean that. What I mean is the way they push themselves and the way they can stretch and they can take something which is constrained and make it less constrained because we give them a chance, right? So when we do the job mapping initially, that's not the end line of the job mapping because if you allow them to work for six months, one year, two years, for those same employees, you can do the job mapping again and you will be amazed that there are certain tasks you left out because you said the comprehension is too difficult for someone with an intellectual disability. Or you said the engagement with other people is too much for a person who's autistic. Or you said something else. Now, and therefore you kept that task out. Because that person has developed over six months to a year to two years. You suddenly realize that they can do something different. Example, for Down syndrome, we said they will work in the coffee shop as far, part of the food and beverage service team. And they'll be in a place where there are other colleagues around. Which means if something gets a little, you know, missed out. There is someone who can very smoothly step in and help that person at that time. So we said when it comes to in-room dining, it's going to be very tough, which is room service, because they'll have to go to the floor in the elevator and go serve that guest on their own. You're not going to send two staff. Now, what's the point then? Then you just send the other staff. We made them learn eventually, some of them, not all of them, some had the ability. Over more than a year, year and a half, we didn't let them go independently. They shadowed another person to understand the floor. So when I come out of the elevator and I have to go to room 546, do I go left or do I go right? He cannot take long to decide. He has to decide fast. And also when he reaches the door, what does he say? How do you ring the bell? What do you do? They observed and observed and observed hundreds of times. And then they practice and the other person observed till they became independent. And this was a task we left out of their de job definition, saying, no, no, too complex, can't do. So what I want to say is that when you treat them as normal, it is amazing how much more normal they in they try to be and they get into it and they participate and they engage. And it's, it's totally fabulous what that kind of development leads to. So I wanted to say that, that yes, do job yeah. mapping. But remember, there'll be evolution as well. The yeah. second aspect I wanted to say, especially to companies who so far may not have yet started this journey, or maybe they've started and it's very early, I'm going to borrow from Nike and say, just do it, because that's the only way you will make this work. I can talk about the seven pillar model, but then it can become theory. I'm telling you, just do it. And if you have questions, we are all available to you to share thoughts and share ideas. So that's what I want to say. Thanks. Yeah, that's something a you know. I wanted to, to yeah something yeah Rakesh something yes, I want, something I wanted to add to what Aradhana said. You know, you, they constantly evolve, and that's so true because I never realized after till I watched uh, you know a series in uh, Prime Video which was called Good Doctor. Good Doctor. So I don't yes. know if any one of you have watched. It's you know, that series yeah. talks about how does an autistic guy is become the best surgeon in the town. And how can he do things which are even better than the best of best doctors in the town? Absolutely. So you're, you're very true. I think it, they, they keep evolving with the passage of time. And we have an example in our in our uh, airline. We have a deaf and mute person, Ashok, is, and he's in Chennai. So when he joined and what he is today, and he is just around the corner to be promoted. And, uh, and that's the power of empowering people who are persons with disability. And, and and so that's 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 what I wanted to add. Yeah, 
Thank you so much. Um, it's been inspiring for me um, moderating this session. And if I were just to pick a little bit from each of you, what you said, I think if you just do it with the right intent, there's magic that could happen. There's, you know, surprise. We are we are definitely bound to be surprised by how people evolve and what they're capable of. So thank you so much, everyone. And I'm going to go to there is a series of questions from our listeners and um, I see these are very practical on the ground, so I'm going to take them one by one. Ranjit, I'm going to bring this question to you. And it's, again, a very practical question to say, how do you ensure accessible infrastructure, especially when most and or many organizations rent or lease out offices on already constructed premises? So how do you navigate this one? See, it's a, it's a very practical question. But at the end of the day, yeah. I think most organizations, when you start leasing, look at empty shelves. They don't hire fully uh, kind of customized offices, number one. Number two, hmm. uh, you know, today, unfortunately, and I think today, fortunately, most of the larger organizations, most of the large business centers, most of the large SEZs are already friendly, are already kind of compliant when it comes to um, uh, you know, ramps and disabilities and everything right. else. So you have a call. You can you can either walk into a compliant facility if you plan this a little earlier, or you can be completely blind to this saying that, look, uh, you know, we're not going to do this. So I think the, the choice becomes very clear in terms of, uh, you know, how you want to approach it. Yes, there will be challenges if you're looking at standalone buildings. There will be challenges if you're looking at, uh, you know, buildings that are not part of large corporations or large SE sets and things like that. But uh, again, uh, it depends on how you craft your contract and how much flexible your workplace can be in terms of uh, the physical nature of things there. One yeah. of the examples is on, on toilets, right, mm -hmm. on, on washrooms. Um, today, you have disability toilets, disability friendly toilets, uh, or at least a provision to change uh, existing, existing washrooms to uh, disability friendly washrooms. Uh, it's a question of how much appetite the organization has. Uh, and I think a little bit of foresight and a little bit of planning will uh, obviously help in this. But but I think uh, in, in our country, especially in India, uh, you know, a lot can be done with, with uh, uh, property owners and things like that in the right spirit uh, to enable some things like this. And this has been very practical for us. Yeah. We are in an NGZ. We've been here for six years. Uh, we've done the audit. We've changed a lot of things. And the SEZ has been very friendly. Uh, in terms of accommodating our change and our request. So with the right approach, attitude, and obviously a little bit of uh, financial assistance, things are things are possible very much in the country. I don't think, uh, you know, we are in a very rigid setup yeah. or an economy at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. I think intent matters a lot, enable, you know, just to be able to address some of this. Um, Anjana, like I said, there is a follow-up question to the ERG discussion that we were having to say, how do you engage with the ERG and you know what role do allies play to create a culture of inclusion? Yeah, I think the, uh, the ERG, when we initially started out, I was just sharing, um, we actually sent, did a lot of sensitization for the core team. We brought in a lot of external speakers. We brought in persons with disabilities within the organization, outside of the organization to come in and speak. And we also got each of the ERG members to share their personal stories, what makes them passionate about being in the ERG and, and driving the change. I think you learn a lot from each other in that process. And interestingly, um, I, I'll just talk about one example that I had. I'm an ally. I had two people who are persons with visual impairment. And uh, we were wondering, you know, um, the first time we sent out these emails and a lot of organization emails come out with beautiful pictures and sometimes these entire content is posterized, right, or picturized. Uh, but do you realize that the person with visual impairment cannot read it unless there is an alt text? And Microsoft, you know, Office has the provision of just right click. You, you have a feature called alt text and you can put in a description of what that picture is about or you can put in the entire text if you want. But people didn't know this. We in the ERG core team had a mix of allies and persons with visual impairment. Every time we sent out an email, you know, we would have first, you know, first time it was educative. Hey, by the way, you know, can you add all text? We cannot see. Uh, then came the sarcastic comment. Hey, that's a great picture, I'm sure. But, you know, can you add the all text? And over a period of time, of course, we got sensitized enough. But then we were like, hey, you know what? This is just not for the ERG core team. We need this for everybody to understand. How can we do it better? And I was the person learning, the one who was an ally who was receiving this knowledge. 
and then there were persons with disability who benefited from others using this technology so we built a program called reading in the dark where we you know created this program during our disability conference we actually created this darkened room we got everyone blindfolded and in the room and we did this in a way that was really hard hitting right we got people to feel what it would be like if you're in a, if you were in a presentation and people were just you know pointing to the slides and the graphs and not really talking about what it is right so then we were like and then we would ask them questions we would ask them and we did it in a very interactive way 15 minutes of this of course people have been blindfolded for 15 minutes you open your eyes out and then there's a person with a visual disability talking to you and talking about that's just the day in a life of mine when you are not sensitive enough about showcasing all text if not about when you're not sensitive about using descriptions when you're you know going through presentations and that just changes and you do this to a bunch of 10 engineers you do to 100 50 500 and suddenly you have engineers wanting to do accessibility not complaining about you know what that accessibility feature that i have to work on for testing it's such a pain and suddenly that same engineers like oh i have to build this in i know now why right. it's going to be important so that's the difference yeah. and that's how allies work um it's not uh, it's not just about the persons with disabilities talking the stories but as an ally i going out there and talking about how you know what sensitization does to me and how i change my ways makes a difference as well yeah very powerful stuff uh, and very powerful stories as well anjana thank you for that and um another question and i'll probably um bring this to rakesh and aradhna if you'd like to add to this as well um so this is a person saying that uh, the person is an active volunteer with special needs group in india and a burning question that the person has is how do we train our specially abled people to match your requirement so the way i understand the question is how do we equip people with uh, persons with disability is how i understand the question i think uh, i think uh, more than they equipping the persons with disability it is the organizations who have taken the lead in equipping the persons with disability what they need to do is as organizations who are volunteering towards this social uh, you know effort is the fact that get the persons mindset to get into a working culture you know because it is also very important to understand that somebody who might have got deprived of opportunities like you and me when they want to face an interview that's the biggest apprehension that they might have so preparing somebody for facing an interview and then meeting those eligibility criteria there is where probably their role will be very very important and predominant and otherwise in terms of providing them the tools and giving them the equity is what companies have taken the ownership and as all of us have spoken about equity i think that's uh, that comes to the employer's part that's what i think sure yeah thank you rakesh Ratna, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. So essentially, it's not that an NGO or a training organization is going to teach the person with special abilities how to work in a hotel or how to work in an airline, because it's not possible unless you run a full-fledged program. The way you run a hospitality or aviation program, there are some uh, organizations, by the way, who partnered with colleges who run these programs, and they're running a hybrid version between their center mm. and that college. that's a great thing but it's a it's a everybody is not able to do this so the expectation from the ngo partner or the training organization is to help them with professional skills life skills like rakesh said get them ready for the interview but i'll just like to say the interview and the working life that's going to come after that so you know what sure. is timing all about what is the way you should speak to your team members when you have two or three different levels of managers you have to listen to all you can't have that approach that i'll only listen to the top boss and i won't listen to anybody else because especially in service organizations there are different levels and sometimes there are uh, we are 24 hour operations right so the manager will keep changing as per the shift so that person we don't know which day that person will be with which manager so that that professional approach that you're going to work in a service organization the customer is king etc that thinking is important a sense of customer service whatever little they can do with respect to the way they speak whether they speak in english hindi or a local language obviously they cannot teach them the whole thing but they can help them improve a little bit uh, they can teach them a little bit about computers they, they may not teach too much but just a little bit but sure. they 
they cannot teach how to be a member in food and beverage service in lemon tree hotel that they cannot teach it's too complicated and it's too specific to us so we will do that once they come that's our job but certainly professional skills life skills and engaging with the trainee and the family about taking this employment very seriously so you if you are expected to be on a morning shift at 7 am then the time is 7 am it's not 7:20 it's not 7:30 it's not 7:40 hotels and airlines don't run like that it's not possible so getting that sense of responsibility so this is what i wanted to say to everyone out there i know there are some parents of people with special needs who are on this session right now why it is important for you to receive the right uh, in various companies for your child to work it is also upon you and your uh, ward to hold and carry through the responsibility of being an employee so both the things go hand in hand if it, if i have rights and i have responsibilities then as much as we are equally providing the right to a person with disability let them also carry that responsibility of being a professional so i think this is an important thing that the ngo got the sense of professionalism sure thank you for that and i think i'm going to open one final question from the um q and a section and you know anyone who'd like to take a shot at that i think retention of employees with disability is is a challenge um or at least it's perceived so and that's one of the derailers for bringing in uh, persons with disability so you know any of you would like to talk about how do you sort of navigate that challenge of retention i can have a go at it um, sure. so with us what we are experiencing is two kinds of team members and since we are dealing mm -hmm. in large numbers we get a chance to see it more one team member is within say 10 days or 20 days that person will leave because they'll say ye humse nahi hoga this is not going to happen why because it's a 9 hour shift it's 6 days a week and your day off may not be sunday no it's a hotel sector correct so and in the case of physical disabilities we also assign night shifts where we can like where it's convenient for that person to do in the case of intellectual disabilities we don't because they get more disoriented and then they cannot perform at all so there's a biological reason for that actually right so what i'm saying is within 10 days or 20 days or maximum one month that person will say that ye to mere bas ki nahi hai i cannot do this and they'll be gone and that attrition is okay for the company because that person's orientation is different that person is not geared for doing a full time job it's all right sure. the second kind of person is who stays 3 years 4 years 5 years maybe more and sometimes if they leave it's either for education or of course they get a job with a higher salary or maybe they're relocating back to their hometown where one of our hotels is not there that also happens sometimes the family sure. situation right? so you can't do much about those things in the situation where the person is moving because of a better salary you can't combat that either you can't say acha you are going for 1000 rupees more don't worry i'll give you 1000 rupees more it doesn't work like that it's not a bargain situation like that what you can do is you can relook at your market salaries you can understand that are you at the right place or not as an organization sure. from an hr perspective and you can build that in also if we can show them growth then obviously they'll stay with us with respect to the environment in the organization i have found that our employees with disability find it excellent the reason is some of them who have left and joined another organization it is fabulous within 6 months sometimes a year they come back and they say will you rehire me the amount of rehires we have had wow. with employees with disability it's not funny because they say that organization is not ready one manager or one hr person said aa jao aa jao we will give you great salary and all uske baad khatam uske baad nahi ho raha hai whether it's another hotel or a retail store or wherever it is it doesn't matter where he went sure. i'm saying this is another interesting thing to keep them engaged and retain it's about how you create the full environment and culture in the company and how you compensate them obviously they are worried about that of course yeah just a That's quick one powerful. i want to add i understand sure. richida we have to end this session just one touch there adding on to what arun sure. has said um, you know how do you how do you make them see their career path i mean are you actually making them equal in terms of anybody else yeah. are they being treated equal because most of the people that we interacted with they don't want to be differentiated and somebody said that they have to be in equal with everybody else who's there at the organization what is their career path like like for example there are folks in our company who have grown through the ranks who joined as an executive and today they are managers they're doing a great job and they have been here one of them has gone into paralympics and won an award 
so things like that how are you engaging them within your organization how do they see their career path and obviously uh, you know something that aradhana said is how do you continuously keep mapping yourself in terms of compensation in the industry sure. and what should make them retain is not in enough and more of surveys that we know across the world money is not the motivating factor all the time thank you yeah. thank you so much rakesh um we'd love to hear more but in paucity of time anjali is there a quick one line that you want to add i think the one line is reasonable accommodations ranjit had highlighted it that the ajo has it but it's just the one thing that levels the playing field because any accommodation yeah. you're giving if it's from a central budget then a manager or an organization doesn't worry about it so that goes a long way in leveling the playing field allowing people to travel people to do whatever they have to get the job done the same way someone who doesn't have a disability can do so um, yeah it goes a long way in retention i've heard it from the mouths of persons with disability so thank you for that anjana and on that note of equality and equity we will uh, wrap up the conversation that we have had today but once again my sincere gratitude for uh, to all the panelists who made time for doing this with us today um very insightful conversation i am taking away a lot of lessons as i'm sure are our listeners today and all the panelists who've joined us we wish you well for your continued efforts and success in enabling inclusion for persons with disability so thank you so much for this um a final reminder those of you uh, who haven't yet signed up for our next and final session in this series which is on 29th please do so at the earliest and help us spread the word within your network as well with that have a great evening ahead everyone thank you so much for joining in thank you thank you everyone thank you